As you guys should know by now, I am a slasher fanatic and take pride in the fact that I have seen almost all of them. Well, just about. Saying that, some of my favourites, specifically ones hailing from the 80s, have been long forgotten, and in my opinion, that should be a criminal offence. So, today on Top 5 Scary Videos, I'm gonna be counting down our list of the top 5 scariest forgotten slasher films. Before we begin, though, be sure to stick around until the end of the video where I'll be responding to some of your comments. And with that, let's jump in. Coming in at number 5, The House on the Edge of the Park, 1980. Directed by Rocco Diodatum, House on the Edge of the Park is an English language Italian exploitation horror starring David A. Hess and Giovanni Lombardo as two criminals who infiltrate a posh gathering in a villa and violently turn against the partygoers after they mock them. Now, this movie is a loose remake of Last House on the Left, in which Hess also starred. Now, the director's name may sound familiar, and that's because he was the man behind the highly controversial Cannibal Holocaust. Now, the movie is part home invasion part rape revenge and part sleazeball sex thriller. Yeah, I know, it's a lot of a lot. It is a movie that pulls absolutely no punches with its gore and graphic scenes that depict sexual torture and razor blade slashings. It is truly disturbing, but is a forgotten slasher that deserves your attention simply because it's a masterpiece of debauchery and has perhaps one of the best twist endings of all time, which says a lot. However, for the faint-hearted, I would say be warned, because this film has moments that I spit on your grave would quake in fear at, and is pretty much the outcome of meshing funny games, Last House on the Left and Henry Portrait of a Serial Killer together. Again, that's a lot of a lot. Coming in at number 4, Slaughter High 1986. What happened to Marty was an accident. It wasn't our fault. Of course it was. And Marty knows it. I'm Directed by Mark Ezra and released in 1986, Slaughter High is a slasher that tells the story of a group of adults responsible for a prank gone wrong on April Fool's Day, who are invited to a reunion at their defunct high school where a masked killer awaits inside. And that masked killer is absolutely terrifying. Now, it's by no means a creative slasher, with it quite literally centering on a bunch of kids getting killed off one by one. But what redeems the movie are the kills, which are truly incredible. Hear me out. One guy gets duped into drinking acid, another is melted alive in a chemical bath, one gets his wrist slit and face whacked off by a tractor blade, and the others are barbecued alive on an electrified bed. Yeah. Crazy, right? It is perhaps one of the most nihilistic horror movies of the 80s, which says a lot. The movie makes no effort to goad the audience into cheering for the survivors. Instead, we're rooting for the moralist mass murderer, which is completely and utterly enjoyable. And to top it off, Harry Manfredini scored the movie, which might even be better than his work on Friday the 13th. Coming in at number three, The Burning, 1981. Eddie! Watch. How come Karen left her early? Hey, look. It's like Michelle said, okay? She was upset about something, all right? Released in 1981 and directed by Tony Malum, The Burning is a slasher that tells of a camp that tells of a summer camp caretaker named Cropsy who was horribly burnt from a prank gone wrong. Years later, after being released with severe disfigurements, he seeks to target those responsible at a nearby summer camp. Now, the film itself is based on the New York urban legend of Cropsy, a boogeyman-like figure with a hook for a hand, lurking in the woods seeking out his next victim. And this is what goes down in The Burning, which took place three years before Freddy invaded our screens and dreams. This was a movie which gave us our first deep fried psycho of the slasher era. Now, this movie was produced by he who must not be named, Harvey Weinstein, and follows the aforementioned groundskeeper who was out for revenge and armed with a pair of humongous pinking shears, making an unannounced return to camp, ready to make not just heads, but all limbs roll. And to top it off, the legendary Tom Savini was the man behind the gore effects, which should be incentive enough to check out this movie. However, if that's not enough, the movie also features a ton of actors before they became big stars, such as Fisher Stevens, Jason Alexander, and Holly Hunter. Queen. Coming in at number two, Hell High, 1989. Did you have some trouble with those punk kids today? I, I can take care of myself, thank you. 
directed by Douglas Grossman back in 1989, Hell High is a slasher that centers on a school teacher who suffers a mental breakdown after being harassed and attacked by a group of teenagers. Now, during the attack, the teacher accidentally kills two of the teens that attacked her. Bad news bears. Now, upon release, the film didn't receive the greatest of reviews, which is understandable after hearing the plot. But this film is fun and deserves a little more respect. By the end of the 80s, the slasher subgenre was already on its last leg, so it was no surprise when this indie horror came out of nowhere and again didn't receive a whole lot of love. Not only is it fun, but it also has more twists and turns than an English countryside road. Only Brits will understand that. Anyway, the film is formulaic, yes, but it has enough intrigue for you to easily forget about it. Without giving too much away, the victims in the movie and victimizers aren't exactly who or what they seem. And just when you think you've got it all figured out, enter another twist and yet another turn. The film honestly deserves more respect, as does indie director. To Douglas Grossman. At the time, it seemed the slasher formula had outrun its course. However, Hell High certainly had other ideas, injecting vitality into the subgenre just when it mattered most. Honestly, check it out. It is a hidden gem in the horror genre. Trust. Now, I know not everyone agrees with me, with Richard Harrington from the Washington Post stating, I quote, Even within the limited expectations of the horror genre, it's not particularly satisfying since the chills are on the cheap. However, sitting through Hell High is likely to bring back at least one high school memory. That of a long, long detention made worse because you have to pay for it. Savage, Richard. Savage. To that, I say, bah humbug. And finally, coming in at number one, The House on Sorority Row, 1983. Released back in 83, The House on Sorority Row follows seven sorority sisters throw a graduation party and play a prank that goes horribly wrong. They always do. Ending up with a dead body. They panic and try to hide it, but someone witnesses the crime and begins to murder them one by one in this cult classic. Now, this film often gets lost in the mix of other slasher movies, considering a few similar titles were released around the same time. The Dorm That Dripped Blood, The Sorority House Massacre, Don't Go In The House, etc. So it's easy to see why folks forgot about House on Sorority Row, which is a shame because this Mark Roseman movie is genuinely good and has some great gruesome gross out effects. In 2017, Complex named The House on Sorority Row the 21st best slasher film of all time, which is quite the feat. I quote, The House on Sorority Row is fortunately more than just a puberty motivator for young boys. Director Mark Roseman does his best to stage prolonged moments of suspense, approaching the film's kill scenes with his Hitchcock influences intact. Scream 2 also makes references to the movie with references to four other college themed slasher films The Dorm That Dripped Blood, Splatter University, Graduation Day, and Final Exam. Although you may not be familiar with The House on Sorority Row, you may be familiar with the remake, which was released on September 11th, 2009, called Sorority Row and starred Ruma Willis and Carrie Fisher. Sadly, that film did not live up to its legacy and was a huge flop. Honestly, it was a waste of an hour and a half. Never again. Well, there we have it. Do you guys agree with our list? Were there any forgotten slasher movies that we missed? Leave us all your thoughts and feelings in the comments down below, and perhaps we can do a part two. Before I go, though, I just want to respond to a few comments from one of our last videos. Top five worst horror movie sequels, part three. No one said Lucy's nostrils are hypnotic. That they are. I can do a lot with my nostrils. Damien said, please give a shout out. Love your bloopers, Lucy. Here's your shout out, and thanks so much. I don't know if I have bloopers in this video, so sad times for you, and only you. Sean McCarthy said, if I had to choose between Lucy and Freddy Krueger to haunt my nightmares, I'd choose Freddy. I'd rather be slashed to death than have the Dark Queen rip my soul in half. You're a very, very smart man, Sean. I'll remember these words when I'm in your nightmares tonight, as I am every night. And on that note, if you haven't already, be sure to give this video a big thumbs up, subscribe, and turn on notifications so you never miss another scary bit. And until next time, see you later. And razor blade slashings. Ah, I just spat everywhere. One gay get one gay. <laughs> Henry Manfredi Manfred Fre Fredini. Manfredi. Fredini. Henry Harry. I said Henry. Harry Manfredini. To that, I say, bah humbug. <laughs> I was clearly in a really good mood when I read the script. Some of the things I wrote. <laughs> this Lucy is a good Lucy. <laughs>
Honestly, it was a waste of an hour and a half. Half. <laughs> Who's texting me? That they are. I can do a lot with my nostrils. Editors, please zoom in on this. I could go for days. Hmm. <laughs>